Okay. Okay, so welcome everyone again. Um, my name is Ines Bulic uh, Kozokariu. I'm the uh, director of the secretary from, uh, for the European Network on Independent Living. And uh, with uh, my colleague, Nick Crosby, uh, we have been, uh, we have put together this webinar, um, which is the second in a two part <laughs> webinar series uh, called uh, Ordinary Lives organized uh, in the framework of um, European Coalition for Community Living. Um, the first in the first webinar, which was about a month ago, we talked about uh, the building blocks of uh, community life, uh, what it takes, what kind of support, uh, what kind of actions are needed for uh, disabled people to be able to live independently in the community. Uh, today, we'll focus a bit more on um, the situation uh, on getting people out of institutions, right? Uh, so, which is um, obviously really important. We still have uh, thousands, uh, hundreds of thousands of people living in institutions across the world, and um, so we try to we try to uh, you know dedicate uh, webinars to, to that, to discussing different strategies, hearing what what people are doing, listening, you know, hearing from from uh, people who have managed to move away. Uh, not just from institutions, but, but also from other um, segregated settings like daycare centers as well. So I'm really happy that we've managed to put together a really exciting lineup of speakers from across the world. Uh, so we will be starting with um, uh, no, let me just get this right, uh, Noboru Imamura from uh, the Japanese Council on Independent Living Centers. Uh, who is going to share um, uh, share about uh, the Japanese experience of the institutionalization uh, and inclusive education and uh, what the GIL, the Japanese Independent Living Center, is doing um, on these uh, issues. Um, and Noboru is going to be speaking with um, Hiroaki's help. He's going to be interpreting for him. Um, then we will move on to Slovenia. Uh, we will have uh, three colleagues speaking, uh, Nick Crosby, Jus Kraban, and Brigitta Obreza. They will all introduce themselves when they start speaking, so you know who is coming from where. They will talk about um, the closure of institutions or an institution in Slovenia, and um, yeah, very practically about um, what work they're doing. And the last, and last but not least, we'll hear from uh, Tim and Bridget. I should have checked how to pronounce it. Vogt <laughs> uh, from the Starfire Council. Um, and uh, Tim and Bridget will talk about yeah, closing a daycare center and basically what they've done instead to make sure people are really included in their uh, communities. So um, with that, uh, and after each speaker, um, we will have a little Q&A. So just please, um, you know, uh, hold your questions or put them in the chat and we'll make sure we have time. Uh, we, we should have about half an hour per uh, per speaker um, or speakers to um, all together in, with the questions included. So um, without further ado, I will um, give the floor to uh, Noboru um, and we'll do this. Uh, so um, Noboru and Hiroaki Noboru, uh, please, the floor is yours. Yeah, they will have a PowerPoint as well. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Noboru Imamura from Japan. え、
、それから DPI ジャパンの事務局次長などを兼任してやっています。So、uh, in Japan, I live in Tokyo and I work at the Independent Living Center, Step Edogawa. I'm present there. Uh, while working at the community, uh, this step at the Gawa was also, I'm also joining to,、uh, concerning to a national organizations, one the Japan Council on Independent Living Centers. And this organization, I'm a, I am a vice president. And also I concern with the DPI Japan. And there I am a deputy secretary, deputy secretary general. So, 2019年の時に、えー、イニールのーフリーダムドライブに参加させていただきまして、まあ、その時にお会いした方も何人かいらっしゃいますが、えー、今日はよろしくお願いします。So I joined to, I have a ch chance to join to uh, uh, Inil's Freedom Drive in 2019. I think some of you,、uh, I met you there, and、uh, I'm very happy to make a presentation in this occasion. えー、今日は、えー、昨年、えー、国連から出た総括所見をどう生かすかということで、主に脱出施設に向けた日本の課題と取り組みについてお話ししたいと思います。So, last year, Japan had a concluding observations from a UNCLPD committee. So, I I'd like to make a presentation today about、uh, how do we make use of、uh, concluding observations,、uh, especially on the issue of the institutionalization. So, so before I step into COPAT, I would like to make a brief self introduction. So I was born in 1964, and so I, and now I'm、uh, 90, uh, uh, 59 years old. And、uh, when I was、uh, 29 years old, I broke my neck and so I acquired a disability. So, before I became a disabled person, there, were anybody, there was nobody around me with a disability, so I was indifferent to a disability and society until I became a disabled person. えまあ、皆さんをはじめ世界中のいろんな問題に気づくようになり、え、ま、皆さんをはじめ世界中のいろんな人との出会いもあって、ま、え、トータルで見ると障害者になってよかったなと思っています。But、uh, To join to several activities, including activities in the world. And、uh, so I'm happy to、uh, become disabled because、uh, this disability gave me, gave me a lot of chances. Eh, <laughs> 体調不良で行けなかったっていうことが、ね、悔やまれます。But the one of the, I have one thing I regret. The, I visited Geneva three times, so I prepared for a joint to a constructive dialogue、uh, happened in the last year, but because I have my health problems, I couldn't join to that 
construct dialogue. So this is one thing I regret. Only one thing I regret. え、so uh, this is my uh, profile photo I often use. And uh, well, right side, there are three men. Uh, one is a Mr. Sato, a Secretary General of DPI Japan. And mine the center is a Mr. Hiroshita, uh, chairperson of uh, Japan Council on Independent Living. So we three often make a, uh, make a plan of events, of activities, and also uh, always uh, with Hiro and Masami, uh, we often have uh, also have international activities. So this is a uh, concreting observations uh, as a given to Japan received from a CLPD committee and it's on uh, concreting observations on article 19. Uh, so because of time limitation, I focus upon uh, uh sentence closes which uh, i you know highlighted by red color えまパラグラフ42のところでえま入所施設から地域での自立生活に予算配分を振り分けなさいということを言われましたそれはパラグラフ42a says uh, so by redirecting its budget allocations from the placement of persons with disabilities in residential institutions towards arrangements and supports for persons with disabilities for living independently in the community. Yeah, so ま、これから地域移行をどう進めるか、これについて期限付き目標、期限付きの目標設定、え、立法措置、え、国家戦略を作りなさいということと、都道府県に実施義務を、義務付けをしなさいということが言われました。So and the 42D paragraph 42D says launch in consultation with organizations of persons with disabilities, a legal framework and national strategy with time-bound benchmarks. And so for aimed at the effective transition of persons with disabilities from institutions into independent living in the community on an equal basis with others. And also what this uh, paragraph says, about the obligations on prefectures to ensure its implementation. え、次のページお願いします。え、それでこの指摘を受けて、え、施設からね、地域生活への予算配分の変更についての、ま、え、課題についてお話したいお話をします。so uh with a with a uh this uh suggestion uh earning from uh uh concreting observations so now i'd like to talk about the uh, redirection of budget uh from uh, residential institutions to uh living towards uh, living into community uh, 
われわれ、ジルとか DPI は、えー、去年のまず総括所見自体は、えー、予想以上に、えーまあ、私たちからすると素晴らしい、強く、えー、的を得た指摘をしてもらったなと、喜んでいます。So, uh... Uh, when we had、uh, these concluding observations、uh, last September,、uh, DPI Jill and DPI Japan、uh, consider this one is above our expectation. So,、uh, this、uh, concluding observation pointed、uh, very critically, and uh, so uh, this is very important and wonderful for us. This, this is what we felt.、Uh... なので、この総括所見を、うんまあえー、活用して、えー、脱施設にこう向かおうという機運は、えー、高まる一方で、日本全体の障害者団体全体、または事業者団体も含めて、もうそっちに舵を切るんだっていうふうに、えー、まあ、全体がそっちの総括処刑に習っていこうというふうになっているわけではまだありません。So、uh, now we have JU and the DPI Japan have a momentum、uh, by using this,、uh, using this、uh, concluding observations and、uh, towards the realization of the institutionalization. But、uh, if we look at the Uh, entire Japan, so including all the disability related organizations and,、uh, and all the sectors. I said that、uh, Japan, entire Japan itself, is not yet reached to this momentum. DPI and JIL have said that the DPI and JIL have said that the DPI and JIL have said that the えー、もしくは入所施設に依存しない、えー、地域社会を構築していくことだということを、えーえーまあ、言,いなが言いながら丁寧に、えー、理解を求めて仲間を増やすことに力を注ぐ今は注いでいます。So,、uh, and DPI Japan and ZIL take a position、so、to build a community. That does not depend on the family care and the residential institutions. So, we deliberately, carefully explain this to a society, to the community, and try to gain、uh, people's understanding. The Chiki Ko Niva, Mitsu no Chiki Ko Garu to Ikata o Steimas. Stotsmeva. 施設からの、えー、地域移行。二つ目は、えー、か親元、家族からの地域移行。えー、そして三つ目が、えー、施設職員の地域移行。この三つを合わせて、えー、やるべきにやらなければいけないと言っています。And for this realization of this deinstitutionalization, transition to community, Uh, we emphasize the three p o i n t So we said that、uh, we need a three,、uh, three, type, three types of、uh, transition to the community. First one is a transition from a residential institution to community. Second one is a transition from a family care to a community. Third one is a transition of staffs of institutions. To the community. So we emphasize that there are three, we need these three transitions to the community. So, in the page, you can see the same thing. So, in the case of the world, the people who are in the world, the people who are in the world, 地域生活支援拠点という、まあ、仕組みがあるんですが、こちらの機能強化っていうことを、えー、今取り組んでいます。And、uh, when we look at the、uh, registration, legislation, the act、uh, in, act in Japan, 
so uh, there is a uh, uh, law on uh, uh, community transition. So a community living support basis, we call it. And so we are, try we are trying to strengthen uh, the community living support function of a community living support basis. で、この地域、この拠点の中に地域移行に特化した専門職として、えー、地域移行コーディネーターという、まあ、専門職を設置すること、こちらを求めて今、今、えー、いろんな交渉をしています。And now we advocate to uh, uh, set or to uh, allocate uh, community transition coordinators, allocate community transition coordinators at the community living support basis. Uh, so uh, they are the expert for supporting a transition to the community. So we're now advocating about for, for allocating for realization of this function. えー、もう一つは、このコーディネーターの、まあ、権限というか、まあえーちまあ、ち力というかあの、コーディネーターがいくらこの計画を立てたり、あの人や事業所をつないだとしても、必要なサービスの支給決定は市町村が行うために、コーディネーターの意見が尊重されない支給決定をされると、えー、十分な地域生活が、あのあの安心した地域生活が遅れなくなってしまうので、えー、コーディネーターの役割、えー、権限っていうのがどこまで取れるかっていうのも今、大きな、えー、交渉のポイントになっています。And the other point of we advocate or actually negotiate with the Japanese government is the how much of authority these community transition coordinators have. This means that uh, even though even though we have a community living support basis and the community transitions coordinators, and the actual decision on the amount of support service is uh, only made by a local municipalities. So if so, uh, you know, it's difficult to include the voices or necessity of deinstitutionalization to the actual support services. So uh, to secure the, the support service for, for community living, it is important to strengthen the authority of uh, community transition coordinators. So uh, now we are negotiating with the Japanese government on this point too. えー、あと日本では市町村の力がまああの、えー、支給決定における市町村のは、うん、力が強いんですけれども、市町村ごとに。えーまあ、ロ,ーカローカルルールって呼んでますが、市町村ごとのおールールによっては、えー、国で言っていることよりさらに良くするというルールならいいんですけれども、国が言っていること以外により、国より厳しく、えー、支給抑制するような。ローカルルールを作られるケースが結構増えてきていて、今、そこ,そこの是正も取り組んでいます。And, uh, and in, our, uh, in Japan,、uh, local municipality, each local municipality has a certain authority to、uh, make an amount of the provision of support services for,、uh, for persons with disabilities. And,、uh, Many local municipalities h a s its own rule. We call it a local rule、uh, on the decision of、uh, amount of support service. And some of these rules sometimes uh, uh, they use、uh, to limit the amount of support service, even though the you know,、uh, national standard、uh, 
supposed to provide more support services, but because of uh, some local rules, uh, because of the local rules, some local municipality try to limit the amount of services. So uh, uh, we also negotiated to prohibit uh, or correct such local rules that create a social that create a barriers uh, for persons with disabilities to have independent living. え、あとあの、統括所見で脱施設とともにもう一つ強く指摘されたのがインクルーシブ教育のことです。And uh, in the concluding observations to Japan, uh there are two emphasized the point. One is that the institutionalization, the other one is uh, inclusive education. And so I put this point on the point number seven on this slide. So building and uh, we really need a building an inclusive society. Uh, uh, okay, building up an inclusive society starts with inclusive, inclusive child care and education. So uh, we also strongly emphasize on this point. Uh, え、移民の受け入れの拡大と含めた人材確保ということも大きな課題になっています。And uh, and also uh, I'd like to add this point that uh, now in Japan the population so Japan is an aged society now so and the population is in the process of uh, uh reducing is getting smaller and smaller. So uh, we really need to think about uh, uh, you know, securing the human resources, uh, receiving the human resources from uh, overseas. This is also an important point, uh, important issue we are facing now. え、and this is the action plan we have. So a uh, fiscal year 2024, so next year, uh, there will be a study group on the status of institutions and uh, including community, tran so community transition. On this study group, we will have a discussion with the uh, government side and also including OPDs. え、それと障害者基本法という法律があるんですが、え、ここで、え、脱施設につながる文言をどれだけ入れ込めるかっていうことも大きなポイントになっています。And uh, also uh, there will be a revision of basic act for persons with disabilities. So uh how many sentences, how many words on the deinstitutionalization we can include into the revision is also an important issue will come in the next year. え、この基本法の改正をま、改正されるってまだ決まったわけではないんですが、まず改正することの働きかけをして、え、それをきっかけにして え、脱出に向けた、え、脱出のための、え、法、法律法をしていくっていうのが、ここ数、今後数年の目標になっています。
And uh, well, uh, this revision of basic act has not uh, decided yet, but uh, we you know, strongly advocate for towards a revision. And uh, if revision will be made, uh, this will be also another opportunity to make a several legislations toward on the, uh, for the deinstitutionalization. This is what uh, we are working upon for in these several years, during several years. で、and uh, Japan has to submit second country report to a CLPD committee in uh, 2028. So toward that year, we keep our, uh, we continue our activities to make a you know, good report uh, in 2028. Okay. Yeah. まあみんなで消化と処刑を生かして、インクルーシブな社会を実現していきたいということで、え、ま、え、頑張っています。え、皆さんともえ、連携し、連帯しながら取り組みたいと思いますので、今後ともよろしくお願いします。ありがとうござい
you have a question from Cesar. Cesar, go ahead. Please, uh, please unmute yourself. Yeah. I just wanted to ask if the action form is an internal document of your organization or a document made by the Japanese government because it looks like a great document, like a great step-by-stepえ、あの、アクションプランについて活動計画、行動計画について質問なんですけれども、この行動計画は団体の中で作られた、ま、障害者団体、中で作られたものなんでしょうか、それともこれは日本政府による行動計画なんでしょうか、とま、とてもあの
social care institution in which they have one locked ward. So basically, yeah, that's for now. Brigitta, would you like yeah. to Hi. Add? Yeah. Hi, I'm Brigitta. I work in Domna Krasu in Slovenia. That's one big institution where we have one um, locked ward. And I just became uh, a head of a locked ward uh, this month. So um, I will present a little bit about our um, work in a locked ward and about uh, the process of the institutionalization of our um, our institution. Um, we call this um, we call the the presentation. It starts with well, not a plan. It starts with a person. We put the word out there, plan, because often people think it's all about a process, and it's really quick and easy to forget that this is about people and their lives. So it starts with a person, and that's really the kind of core thing that 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 we're talking about today. Um, the the photograph there is 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 kind of ECCL in action. So this is the European Coalition of Community Living in action um, across the UK and Slovenia. So Yush and Brigitte came over for a week back in October and uh, spent a lot of time with some of the people I'm working alongside, um, learning about what what we do over here and I spent quite a lot of time over in Slovenia learning about what the guys in Slovenia do so it's a good exchange um we're going to talk a bit about um our own bits of work about supporting people to move out of institutions most of the people we're talking about are either in secure wards in England or locked wards in Domna Krasu so very individual people with um usually with very traumatic lives um lots of very individual support needs and a very individual approach to life but most of us do have that um so that's what we're going to talk about um and we'll kind of briefly round up with a few things that we share in terms of whether it's england whether it's slovenia and i suspect whether it's anywhere in the world are kind of the, the core things that that make a difference so what unites our work, what brings uh, the work that we're doing in England with Slovenia, it's uh, the Article 19. It's very simple. It's the right to live independently and be included in the community. Um, both of us um, advocate very strongly on it being a basis of human rights. So it's a right to liberty in the UK. It's a right to liberty. It's a right to a family life. And those are echoed within the articles of the UNCRPD. I guess what's different about the two countries in England, we're talking about about some people who are in long stay, secure forensic or inpatient mental health units, disabled people in those units. Um, and in Slovenia, um, there's three. Oh, you, you you can talk that one through. Um, yeah. So different numbers in 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 each, but. Um, the thing that unites the work that we're talking about today is the kind of the, the fact that we're getting people out of secure and locked wards. At which point I will hand swiftly on to Brigitte and Yush to talk about Slovenian work. Yeah, thank you. So I put two pics, pictures on um, our slides so you can um, maybe visualize where we come from. Um, Slovenia is really a small country and um, Domna Krasu um, in Dutovlje is uh, like really small, small part of Slovenia, but I think we are doing um, quite big wo work because um, and we, they, Domna Krasu have been doing that since 2003 because in 2003 um, they opened their first group homes and they opened the doors of the institution because until 2003 the whole institution was locked. Um, so, and then since um, 200 to, to 16, yeah, 216, we have now a locked ward where um, people are put um, with the court orders. Um, so Nick, if you 
can have a slide. Next one. Yeah, thank you. Um, so since uh, 2020, um, the whole institution of Domna Krasu um, went through um, the process of the institutionalization um, where we relocate, moved out um, 70, uh, 70 people. And we now have um, more than 40, almost 50 individuals that still live in the institution. And um, the big part of that is, are the people from the locked ward. Um, our locked ward is ver verified for um, 12 people. And now we have 17 of them. Um, so it's small place uh, that is overcrowded um, most of the time since it's um, since it is, it's exist, exists um, there were some attempts before to um, move people out of the lock ward um, that that were successful and some of them that weren't really successful um, so since our project started, um, we really try to um, acknowledge our um, mistakes and our um, good work and everything that went wrong and everything that went right. Um, so our goals for um, moving forward and um, help people get out of the lock ward are um, we really are trying to reduce the number of residents in the secure unit um, one person at a time um, because um, our goal is not to um, put people in uh, smaller group homes it's really our biggest wish to um, to move them in their their homes in um, closer to their families or wherever they wish to be. Um, so one person at a time, um, as usual, we'll talk a little bit more about uh, with good personal plans, um, with good support, um, support from us, from their families, from, um, everyone that's really included in their lives. So um, our first step is to resettle some of our residents in the Gorishka region. Um, they will be resettled in uh, smaller group homes um, because for now that's, that's the best that we can do in such a short time that we have on our hands. Um, but moving on, as I said, one person at a time um, in a community. Um, so we'd, we would really like um, to transform our secure unit um, or lock ward to, um, to the community, to community, um, um, sorry, I lost my words. Um, yeah, just to resettle people in the community and um, design our work in a way that we can be um, of help in the community for everyone, not just for our residents to say. Um, but for that, we know that we have to establish good teamwork um, that is focused on the individuals because uh, right now on our locked ward, um, the primary, um, well, everything uh, evolves around um, that um, structure uh, that we have in our institution um, and everything has to be done in the in that way that was done in like for 12 30 years 
So I think that's the first step that we have to take and establish a really good teamwork uh, that won't evolve around um, our, um, our schedules and our work. Um, so as I said, um, through that, um, through those smaller steps, we would really like to um, take our care to um, be based on the person um, and evolve around them and not around us and our institution. Um, but we have some limitations um, in our work. Um, the first one is uh, time for sure, because we have um, like a short amount of time. Um, the court orders are um, a big problem because um, even though our um, secure unit is um, overcrowded, we still get uh, court orders for immediate placement, um, and we can we can't uh, do anything about that. Um, so the next limitation is, of course, the lack of interest of the personal um, professional public um, in solving the problem of secure units in general in Slovenia. Um, so yeah, that's. That's, there's not really a lot of um, interest in uh, closing them. Just let, let's just say that. Um, so, and of course, the lack of a common language and direction and vision um, of different professions goes along with that. Um, so the secure units for now are the solution to not dealing with problems in the community. And in Slovenia um, right now, um, our court system and everything um, around that, um, it's the secure units in Slovenia are like, um, sorry for lack of better words, but they are like, a bin for everything that we don't want to see on the streets and in the community. So we just put them in the secure units. Um, so yeah, I think that will be all from me and you can um, take on. Okay, thank you. I'll be brief just to, to tell some um, maybe uh, biggest things that we came up uh, with um, during the the process of uh, of resettling people so um, we really found out how person-centered planning is really crucial and this we kind of knew already but through the our contact with Nick this was, I think, the biggest topic. Um, and in our work, it was uh, very interesting to see, for example, that um, there are many users in the locked unit who, um, that we really don't know any, almost anything about them. Also professionals who uh, all the time work with them may not know basic things about who this person really is. Um, and so, by by person centered planning we mean that we talk with person a lot we try to really found, find out who this person is what does he or she want um, where uh, to live uh, which support and to how this support should be delivered and so on so um yeah it, this was a huge um and nice experience for us because also uh, as it's written here, uh, it was also having a good time with people, really, and um, it, it was it was really nice. For example, to play guitar with the with the guy who really has a passion for for um, uh, for for music and so on. And this really hasn't taken place before, or or it it has, but really very rarely. So um, th this was really uh big big um experience for us um also uh working with persons beloved ones is very important for us um there are 
some people who don't have anybody anymore, but still um, those who have um, can really, th those beloved ones can really um, massively impact our planning and um, we have to really see them as a uh, allies. Um, so yeah, uh, one thing that is really also rare in institution um, is that people are many times not taken seriously. So um, by writing the personal plan as somebody tells you the story and not trying to um, correct what people say or um, so on. And also if when they can really uh, read uh, their words, uh, it's really a massive thing that can be uh, very powerful. Um, so yeah, uh, th these are all the um, uh, all the conclusions or all the really important uh, experiences that we have gained so far. But there are still lots of obstacles um, for people who find communication less. Um, uh, yeah, well, um, not so easy, or that we don't find it easy to communicate with those. Um, then you need some really more time to um, to plan with. Um, also, people who can't speak, um, we we find that uh, not not just in this institution, but I, I refer to experience also in the others in, uh, that I have. Um, yeah, you need more time, and um, sometimes when we have a lack of time, this is an obstacle. Um, and one general problem is that uh, we uh, often may succeed in doing a good plan, but then implementing this plan in the secure unit, of course, turned out to be impossible. So um, we are now uh, happy to have this opportunity to, to resettle people because by resettling them, we might use these plans in really more constructive way um, because there are so many ch um, challenges in changing institutional settings that, and then the result is that plans are not implemented. Um, people are not, uh, well, they don't gain anything from, from having a plan. But um, however, I, I think that this um, personal center planning is really the, biggest um, starting point, which is really gives us potential for working differently with people. Yeah, so over to you, Nick. You are muted. <laughs> Still muted, Nick. Right. Um, so the, the the piece of work that um, Brigitte and Juice came over to see is is a piece of work that links together our work because it's all about moving people out of locked situations. The work that we're doing in England is setting up small support organisations, small local organisations to support people who are very individual, often with very big histories that come with them. Um, um, but it all starts with the same thing. So it's all about where Yush was talking, what Brigitte was talking about. It starts with the person, it starts with their story, and it's about building a support team around that person. So we recruit people to match. So we don't ask for people to work a number of hours. We, um, or my example is we, we make sure they all support the right football team. Um, or they've got a shared interest in going fishing, or they like going to the, the fairground. It's all about building relationships with people. Most of the people that we're talking about, whether it's in Slovenia or England, have had a very traumatic experience of relationships and connection. Those the connections have ended, connections have been severed, um, and, and things have gone wrong. So building really strong relationships around shared interests and passions and things that matter, are where we all start. 
um they it's also the, the key part in that is that organizations never walk away from somebody some some of the people that we might be walking alongside and supporting can have some very difficult days um and life can be very challenging for them um but it's recognizing that that doesn't change anything we're still there to support them um and so that's that kind of key thing about relationships but it goes back it follows that magic thread all the way back to the person and their story because if you know what the story is then you can start to support people well that's the next that's the core of what we're doing in England it's the link between the work in Slovenia and England it's a link anywhere really but but we we can talk about it in this in this context because it's work that we're both sharing and learning from each other around. And I guess the, the key thing is I'm keeping an eye on time and I want to make sure that we hear from Starfire um, is that um, there, there's something right at the core of this that's a relentless and uncompromising. I don't know how well those words translate, but that's so important that the moment that you compromise on how we on, on, on a put what works for a person is the moment that will start to fail. And the organizations I work, I'm lucky enough to work alongside would say that's where they start and, and end. They'll never compromise on. It doesn't make for easy conversations with the people that are buying the support and the people who are paying for it and for the government. But it's it's basically that we have to stand up for that person and stand next to them and stand true. Um, the, the last, the last slide. Oh, hang on, the words have gone. Um, okay, so the the last slide we we did we we actually agreed three things that we wanted to say. The last slide was was basically what's at the core of this. If it's going to work, it has to start with a person. That, that 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 that's that that's the root of it, and that's the point I've been making. Um, it start it it it's everything centers around that person and the support they need, and it's their life, and we're there to support them. Uh, they don't work for us. We work for for the person, and we walk alongside. But the last part of it was, and it was illustrated by our photograph, is is and 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 to be online with people in Japan and people in America and people in Armenia and and everybody else and Cesar in Spain and everybody else is is that this is a community of people. And actually, I've always taken great great um, uh, affirmation. Um, it's meant a lot to be part of a community of people and we're all challenged to do the same thing. So um, I think that's that, that's very swiftly ended there because I because of time. But I uh, hope people have kind of got the idea that it's all about the person. It's not about the process. Thank you very much, Nick, Yush and Brigitta for um, sharing with us what you're doing. Um, yeah, to me, it's talk, hearing from uh, hearing from uh, Nick now at the end about um, you know this small support team. It made me wonder if it's something similar to these community transition coordinators that they're talking about in Japan. I wonder um, could be. Uh, I mean, it'd be interesting to talk more about both um also i mean it's good to, yeah i think the brigitte the kind of the the limitations that you've shared it's uh yeah it sounds very familiar to um to a lot of the countries and um no i think it's yeah it makes sense to start even with uh with um, a small group of people if if you can do it properly and really make sure that they move into the community and not into another form of uh, segregation. Um, so we yeah, will be really interested to hear how, how that goes um, ahead. Um, I don't know if does anybody have, maybe we could take one question if anybody has before moving on to Tim and uh, Bridget. We have a comment for yeah from, from Tim that no one should have to live their life being unknown or locked up, which is very true. Thank you for that. Um, do we have any questions for the Slovenian team or comments? Not seeing anything. But let's let's if you have hopefully we'll have some time at the end. Uh, let's move to the to Tim and Bridget uh, from the, from Starfire Council in the US. 
Now they have actually managed to accomplish something as far as I understand, something that works well. So, I mean, we heard in Japan, they are, they put together a good action plan. Um, in Slovenia, they're also kind of at the beginning of trying to do something. So it'll be good to hear about something that, you know, you've accomplished and how, how that went, uh, your experiences. But I'll let you explain. Um, I'll let you explain. I think, Tim, uh, you will be starting first. So, Tim, yeah, we see your presentation. Um, yeah, maybe if you're speaking, you're muted. Is that better? Yeah, that's better. Great. Can hear you. So. Oh, you've muted yourself, Tim. We could hear you, but there oh, we no. go. There yeah, we go. No, it's good. Uh, we're really grateful to be with y'all, especially around this courageous stories we just heard. Um, I'm Tim. Bridget is one floor above me. We've been married for uh, 21 years, and we've been in the work uh, together for 25 years, uh, 24 of them at Starfire. So we're going to tell you how we made a colossal mistake thinking we were doing the right thing. And then we rectified that. We spent our entire careers doing that. So our old story at Starfire is that we ran a day program and outings for people with developmental disabilities all over Cincinnati, Ohio. We took people uh, to pumpkin patches and dances. That's me in the Santa Claus hat at a dance for 150 human beings with uh, developmental disabilities. We really got successful. We raised four million U.S. dollars and opened a day program. Had about 150 people uh, come into our building every single day, and um, had waiting lists for our services. And we're pretty busy patting ourselves on the back for such wonderful social work. And um, you can just tell everybody was having relatively good time relatively safe experience. But one of the things we wanted to uh, tell you about was being disrupted. Um, our institution looked prettier than some of the locked wards we just heard about, right? But our institution was still a dead end, a social dead end, where people only really knew people with disabilities and these rotating cast of staff at our organization. So we decided that we would do something about it because these questions kept bothering us. Did our work, which we thought was wonderful and everybody else told, told us was wonderful, perpetuate loneliness and social isolation? And if we're responsible for that, what are we gonna do about it? One of the things that helped us was understanding that it wasn't just us, that the entire disability experience where we were here in, here in the States, was re kind of in the form of, let's take people with disabilities, put them in the separate room, right? Special education, special sports, special group homes, special workshops, everything was separate. And then people just had that same experience at our building as well. And it wasn't even just disability. This was also the pattern of nursing homes for the elders of our community. This was the pattern of a prison system. This was a pattern of schools. This is a pattern of addiction clinics. This was a pattern of, of homeless shelters, right? So in a way, we started to notice that we were part of a social movement to send people, I think as Brigitte said, that were different or that showed up differently in the world away, right? So we're actually facilitating or accepting delegation of uh, the lives of, you know, our neighbors with disabilities um, from the community. Three things that we think you need to know why this is happening and why we got stuck in this trap and why you find yourself stuck in the trap if you are trying to get out of it. One is we're just stuck in a path that's created by our history, right? So we use the uh, idea of a typewriter or a keyboard. 150 years ago, a typewriter was set up in, in our country with QWERTY. It wasn't alphabetical. It was Q-W-E-R-T-Y on that first, you know, row of, of buttons. 
Here we are 150 years later, they did it because the hammers were getting locked up on a typewriter if they type too fast, right? So 150 years later, we still have a QWERTY keyboard on our phones. There's no hammers, right? The typewriter doesn't even exist in the same form, but we're just stuck in a path that has uh, been going on for 150 years. We think that's kind of what's happening to us. We were stuck in a path. We saw people with disabilities sent away, and we said, well, let's make it a better version of that, right? So everybody's stuck in that historical path. The second thing is, it's just about money, at least here. We were able to bill $7 a person an hour. And if we put 10 people in a room, that became $70 an hour, right? There are some rooms in Cincinnati where we work, where there are 20 human beings with disabilities in the same room that organization is billing $140 an hour. They're paying out 12 bucks. So they're profiting $128 an hour. So essentially we're just addicted to the cash, right? We have these business pressures. We built we build our, our, annual, um, our annual budgets on how many people can be in a room and how we can bill for that. And um, then we hire staff accordingly, right? So a lot of it was about that. Again, we thought this was all wonderful. The last thing is important is that this is about mindsets. This is about devaluation. It's systemic. It's in our system, right? It's historic. It's been going on for a long time. And it's cultural. It's in our culture as well. And these are just a few of them. Y'all recognize them, right? That people with disabilities are seen as a monolith. Those people, them, right? Which is wild as Yushin, Nick, and Brigitte just said, we have to get to the person's individual story, right? Fionn said it last time too. I, my personality is lost if I'm not living my own unique life, right? So then we see people as not fully human. Well, we'll send them away to Starfire and that's perfectly fine. We see people as objects of other people's pity or charity. Well, you can be a part of things, but only if I can take my selfie and get some likes on, on social media for helping you, right? Or I can make a donation to Starfire and feel good about myself. So all of a sudden, people become objects, right? We saw the piss on pity shirt that Nick shared in the chat, which was terrific, right? We love that. But we did that, right? We recreated that mindset that people are dangerous or violent, need to be locked up, that they're a burden on society. And that we as the service system are here to relieve you of the burden as long as you keep paying us, right? And lastly, that people are eternal child. They're not going to get a job. They're not going to fall in love. They're not going to have a neighborhood party because that's just not what people with a mental age of a three-year-old do, right? So all these things are critical and especially that last part because the experience around disability, the assumptions, the stereotypes, the mindsets that cause the segregation and the isolation are born every time we hire a new staff, right? It's 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 in the water of our society. And so every time we hire a new staff, we have to unlearn, help them unlearn everything. Every time a child with a disability is born to a family, we have to help that family unlearn all the social conditioning that they have had around disability, right? So this is about changing mindsets. So we decided to shut down our day program. It's, it's, as successful as it was. And this is the question that helped us. I was the director and Bridget was doing some of the programs, but we understood that for us to be successful, human beings with disabilities were paying the price so that we could have business as usual continue, right? So all of this is about asking people with disabilities to pay the price of our comfort, of our business success, and of our um, pride in what we are as a community. So our responsibility was to shift. So Bridge is gonna tell us some of the new stories that popped up. Ready, Bridge? Sure. So we had a day program and we started to move to that one-on-one, -on -one, one person at a time, kind of like you all mentioned. It's really the only way to go. Um, and instead of, so with our time, we were looking for people and places to connect the person with a disability to. Um, we had a day program, a building, but we were really conscious of going to where people lived. Sometimes when we had that day program, people were in a bus for over half an hour to an hour to get there. 
Um, so really looking at where they live. So these were close connections, um, people that, that, you know, if they met someone, but by what we were doing, maybe they'd run into each other at the grocery or at church, that those people would in the community would start to see them um, and know them in ways that aren't falling into those devaluation things. So really looking for ways to people to show up maybe in an unexpected way to surprise those community members and so that they would appreciate and respect them. So this is Robbie um, in his neighborhood. We knew one of his neighbors. He was known in his neighborhood. Everybody would wave to him, but they really didn't know much about him. Friendly guy, wave to him. He's always on his bike. We got to know some of his neighbors, they as a group. So once we were spending time connecting and getting to know people, our ultimate goal was to build something together with those neighbors and people from the community. So he and his neighbors, they all love bikes. They started a bike ride, a neighbor once a year, an annual neighborhood bike ride. Um, they called it Pedal Palooza. It was a fundraiser. Um, their neighborhood had a volunteer fire department. And so it was a fundraiser for a place where Robbie spent a lot of time hanging out with those firemen um, and volunteers. So he became known as a, um, you know, people got to know him and in a very positive way where he was now a a, like a community organizer and a philanthropist. This is Sam. Um, she had um, an interest in crafts and handiwork, like she's good with her hands. We found a local pretty close to our house yarn shop and um, fabric store where she took um, sewing lessons on a machine. So again, things that we would not do in a day program is machine getting, getting out sewing machines and sewing it as a group of 20 people. Um, so she took lessons, met the owner of the store, Terry. She's there in like the scarf and on the side to the left. Um, and she got to know Terry and some of the other women and Terry um, let us was a part of organizing a monthly day of like volunteer project sewing. So one day was sewing bibs to donate to families in need babies. Um, and from there, Sam got to, other women encouraged her to join a quilt guild where they have monthly meetings and they share their quilts and sewing projects and also sew together. This is Telly. Um, Telly was um, his neighborhood had a soup kitchen that he was involved in. Um, this was one of those, I think we talked to forget it. Like if, if we could go out in a smaller group, we thought that might be a great thing. I know you said like we're avoiding these group homes, right? Um, we, at some point in our thinking, well, if we go out as a big group, maybe if we go out as a small group, it'll be better. Like instead of taking 10 people with disabilities, we'll just take five or three. And we quickly realized with Telly, we were volunteering um, and Starfire, our organization got the credit for that volunteering, right? Everybody be like, hey, Starfire, how are you? Versus actually getting to know Telly and saying, thank you, Telly, for showing up. So we quickly, we recognized what was happening and we stopped and just, right, again, one person at a time. But this is Telly showing up, volunteering with people from his neighborhood to help the neighborhood out. And also that's him giving the gifts and appreciating those other volunteers. So he made aprons to give them and showed up as like an appreciator and encourager of all the people there. This is Jenny, so um, you can't see it, but she uses a walker and she somewhat has um, a slow pattern of speech that some people find hard, to, most people find hard to understand. Um, she was interested, she really loves yoga, which again is sort of contradicts somebody, you don't necessarily think of somebody who uses a walker being a big yoga enthusiast. Um, but so we spent time getting to know other yoga instructors. She liked meditation, um, she's very spiritual. And she also found a place close to her home um, in her neighborhood to volunteer called Bake Me Home. Um, so again, that place where she would run it, she was a volunteer, her family, some of these people that I've shared, um, have family involved and some did not Telly's family wasn't, it was pretty relied on the staff to get them places versus Jenny's family was pretty involved, started volunteering there together and ex everyone increased their connections and what they were doing. So she put on, um, a day of yoga, um, organized with Bake Me Home and some of those other yoga instructors some yoga opportunities that were again, donation-based and she got to donate that money back to Bake Me Home. Um, through the year of doing these and making these connections, she decided she wanted a, a community job, which was not in her, um, her or her family's um, thinking. But after this, um, Allison up there on the apron, one of the a regular who, who runs Bake Me Home was her good uh, reference and encourager. And she got a job as um, a hostess at a local restaurant at the end of that year. This is Cashel. Um, our staff spent time getting to know Cashel. Um, she was going to a large uh, day program here, in, not ours, but another one that was sort of job focused. And she, when we met her, said she got herself kicked out. Um, she had some pretty, I guess, behaviors that were not tolerated um, at that day program. Um, but 
with the time that she spent one-on-one -on -one with in her neighborhood and also um, discovering that she's really passionate about the arts. Our staff spent time with her and introduced her to more neighbors that shared those passions. And they worked together on projects and started an artist collective that would meet weekly um, to do art and other projects that were important to them. And she actually, she and the group got the Visionary Award one year. So um, talk about changing your status in, in your neighborhood. So all of these stories, all these people were trapped in our day program or another segregated workshop. And all of this would have been lost to the world if we hadn't figured out how to step outside our four walls, right? And when you consider what is waiting to be born, what could happen in a community, if we could just figure out how just to go out and try something new. So our outcomes that we look for are new identities, beyond disability. And we don't just mean for people with disabilities. We think that the community has a disability-oriented identity of itself, meaning it sees itself as donors and volunteers, not as neighbors, right? We think that parents see themselves in a disability-oriented identity, which means that we're going to send our kid to the therapist and we're going to drop them off to the meetings and we're going to go to the system services. They don't see themselves as actual connectors to community and building up relationships for themselves and their own family. And we think the service system too has a disability-oriented identity and that it's always sitting around focusing on people and saying, how do we fix you and make you better so that you can be included by yourself. Whereas really we should be thinking about how do we build the kind of culture where everybody's welcome, right? We're looking for more connections. Notice we didn't say relationships. We're about raising the probability that people have a lot of connections and then waiting to see which one of those start to spark because relationships really belong to people themselves, not to us. We can make as many co connections happen. And as Nick said, it's about common interests, local connections, so that we're crossing paths, like Bridget said, right? Um, and we're last thing, the biggest lesson we learned through all this, disability is not the problem. It's the culture that makes the life hard for people with a disability and their family. That's the problem. And if that's the problem, then our question is, well, who are our colleagues in that work? It's no longer just the people on our payroll. It's no longer the people in the system. Our colleagues become families, neighbors, people with disabilities themselves. And all of us are trying to figure out how do we create a small, little, tiny, personalized local culture <laughs> around a person with a disability. And that's why we try to do projects that are really expanding people's imagination, getting as many people connected to each other and to the person with a disability and their family, if there is a family as possible, and then letting those things kind of nurture and grow. So these projects are just excuses. They're just little kind of sleight of hands. How do we get people to work together on a project and at the end of it, they discover they come to know each other, right? So we think this is more dignified as programming. We decided a few years ago to start giving money instead of just to our staff, we gave them to families. So this is our colleague, Carol, and her son, Grayson. And they started doing projects in their community. We divided up our staff salary and gave it to families. And this is what they did with it in their own neighborhood. This is another uh, family that decided to have a front yard pool party and barbecue. <laughs> and they had like 10 neighbors that each had little pools and, and water games in their front yard. Here's a young man who's autistic in his family. He can't hear clapping. He says it burns his ears, right? But he can also discern 400 different bird calls. And so he joined the Audubon Society, which is a bird call kind of bird lover enthusiast uh, society association here. And he's for the last six years been connected to their bird watches and bird retreats. All of these things are better culture. For us, it's all about mindsets. We've got to shift the mindsets of staff. We've got to invest in younger families now so that they don't dig the hole that we're trying to dig out of in 20 years right, is that it starts, we think, with families saying, I am going to accept services and support, but I'm also going to build up community and networks and social connections for ourselves and for our loved one. And lastly, we think the biggest 
work over the rest of our careers is to change the mindset of the general public. We're not asking you for donations and volunteerism. We're asking you for local connection with someone on your block. We're asking you to know somebody and to do something cool with them that's good for everybody, right? So it's really about messaging and mindsets from here on out for us. And we just really appreciate being in a room with y'all. <laughs> it just feels good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tim and Bridget. Yeah, it's been really great to hear uh, hear about your work and yeah, just uh, the approach. And yeah, really, uh, we don't like the word inspiring, but yeah, it was inspiring. Um, and uh, yeah, we have, I mean, we have so many of these daycare centers everywhere. And I just, yeah, I, I find it really hard to, you know, picture a scene. <laughs> like you've described where everybody works like that at the moment but uh yeah it's great to show uh show examples like this uh, i'm gonna stop talking does anybody have and we've had some lovely comments of course in the in the chat uh would anybody la uh, like to ask question tim uh, and bridget a question or um in case you still have uh you know questions to any other speakers or nick maybe you have well i i comment. i uh, Antonia might want to follow this one up because Antonia typed it in, but I think what Antonia was picking out, and I would echo that, was um, the, the the kind of honesty that you showed in, when you realised that Starfire was going off down the wrong kind of path and that you took action to to tackle that, and that's unusual, and that was, that's what Antonia was um Acknowledging, and I think um, I, I, I back that one up. And it's, um, I guess, what's the reaction of? Um, I, I, I like the story when you said you met a woman, and she got herself kicked out. And I thought, well, that's because she met somebody who was going to listen to her. So it was she wasn't going to stay where she was. Um, but perfect sense to me. But what's the reaction of other support providers around? Do they kind of look on and think? they're just strange or do they look on on you and say we want to be like that well it's both um i would say that uh if you if you talk about local what's what's strange is that there is this ego centric kind of experience around this work so locally all of a sudden we said we're not going to profit off of other people's problems anymore you know we're going to work ourselves out of this model cuz we think it's predatory as y'all named and all of a sudden, we did have a few people that were really pissed off about that because they thought that they had the moral high ground, right? This work gives people this hit of endorphins and dopamine that says, oh, you're a good person. Well, all of a sudden we're saying, yeah, but what if you, the way we think we're good people is actually exploiting other human beings? And then people have to work their way through letting go of that, right? So there was some of that. And um, that's that sucks, but we have to be careful of 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 that because what happens is um, people will blame us versus having to turn the the lens on themselves, right? So we have to do this really kind of gently, unfortunately. Like we'd like to say, you're all a bunch of predatory bigots, right? But <laughs> but if you do that, then people can blame us for being jerks instead of having to say, oh what are we doing that could be, you know, different or better? So it's it's kind of a dance that we unfortunately have to do, which is be um, almost sympathetic and empathetic toward people who we think are committing um, some pretty serious social injustices. Yeah, well, you can come online and say it to everybody in Europe because it's safe. That's why we're here. <laughs> um, and, and there's a follow-on question as well, which is what, what, what was the reaction of the families and the parents of the disabled people that you're that you were working alongside and when you decided that things needed to change or you decided with them that things needed to change? I think it's the same, that it's a kind of a mixed reaction. Some people were very disappointed that our to, we were winning awards for our great day program. So some people were very disappointed and angry that it was being taken away versus seeing the potential of what else was out there. Um, so I think especially the older ones had more struggle with that. And that's part of why we started investing in those younger families who could change that story, who weren't as quite as committed. There are plenty, I know, and as you said, there are plenty of day programs. We weren't the only one in the town in Cincinnati. There are plenty of other options out there. So if they were just looking for that, the time and that bulk of time, and that's what they wanted, 
that there there are other options. So it's not as if we took all, you know, those, it's just not what we were going to do. And I think some families really understood. Um, there were those families who weren't interested in our day program that were curious about this. You know, there were those new people that now we were doing things differently that spoke more to them and what their values were for their family and their child. So, um, yeah. Y younger families are grateful for having the veil lifted for them. And they can move forward as soon as you teach them. You say, look, the system will always system, meaning your staff's always going to turn over and the system's always going to look out for its billable hours and you're going to face some rejection from your community. But then we also teach them there's gold out there if you can find it in community. So they'll look for those two things. And as soon as they see it, they're kind of like in that for life. They'll know that they have to make some compromises here and there, but at least they'll know that that doesn't define them, which is critical. For older families that were dependent on our services, honestly, we just shut it down because we couldn't stomach doing it anymore, right? It took us seven years, but we just did it. Now, if, if somebody said, look, I'm running a day program and I still want to do this, we, we teach other organizations how to like just take a little bit of time and then get somebody a half a day volunteering or a full day, you know, working at a job or something. And that helps people kind of spring out a little bit at a time and it lets the organization still stay mostly online for everybody. So we're not big on just shutting it down unless it's just us saying, can't do it, I'm sorry. Really cool. Um, and there's a there's a question about um, will the slides and the recording be shared? And the answer to that is definitely yes. Yeah, I sent it to you, Ennis. Right? Yeah. Did you get it? Yeah, I have the presentations. Yeah, I will share. And I think, I mean, if anybody, <clears throat> all our speakers, if you have any, you know, any resources that you think might be helpful to people that, you know, you've developed uh, tool toolkits or whatever, please do share. Uh, also with us, I just wanted to comment. Uh, I mean, I think, of course, you, you, you. I mean, you've changed your service. Uh, you can't force others to change as well. But it's great for people to have that option. I mean, at least for people that live where you are providing um, this. So, if it, people could at least choose between, <laughs> you know, a daycare center and something else, that would already be a, a great. Um, uh, I mean, that would already be great. Cesar has to send up. And I have to say, we have uh, captioning books until four minutes ago. So thank you, Norma, for staying. But you have to, if you have to leave, then we'll just move on to without captioning for another couple of minutes. I just wanted to congratulate you on your self exploring of your actions first going from the service provider then to the disabled people as a group and then to the individual as a person. I see a step-by-step -step process that you have had to follow and you really have done it very nicely and I really enjoyed that, hearing that. I Thank think, you, Cesar. Do you think we as a group or as individual should do the same thing? Thank you. Yeah. I appreciate that. And what I'll say is we are still noticing that people with disabilities voices are still trapped in advocating for the system. So in our country, a lot of people with disabilities are called self advocates, right? <laughs> and their advocacy then is limited to their disability, once again, it's institutionalized, right? And it's profited on. And so we're really interested in the next few years of emerging voices that advocate for a better society in general, or for cool bird people to get together, or for awesome block parties, or for healthy communities and neighbors connecting, right? Because um, right now our system's really good at using 
voices of people with disabilities and voices of families of people with disabilities to get more money for itself and more power for itself. So don't we don't let your advocacy be trapped. <laughs> I would say. Yeah, thank you for that. I think yeah, that's very much true, and uh, <clears throat> it's also because people are kind of stuck in the system and don't see other options. So uh, that's why we are doing webinars like this. <laughs> uh, and I think everybody appreciated uh, your input and also um, from my colleagues in Slovenia and Japan. Um, and I'm really glad we were able to pull it off given that we have people on kind of opposite sides of the uh, world and different time zones. Uh, does anybody have any last minute question or comment or in case Nick you want to say something for the end um we'll be back when we get a chance to 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 book some more sessions in um I think uh it, 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 it's always just really good reconnecting with so many different people uh people um have been on since the very first one. I don't know if that was you, Cesar, I think, um, back in 2017 or 2018. Um, so no, um, it's really good to 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 catch up with everybody. Want to keep these sessions going. It's a lot dependent on people giving time to present and share their work, even if it front sometimes feels like you've not got a lot to share. This is a big job that everybody's taking on. And sometimes the small things should be celebrated as much as the big changes. Um, just a, a, a really big thank you to to Tim, Bridget, Naboro, um, and your um, skilled interpretation as well. Um, and uh, yeah, good to see everybody. Look forward to seeing you again. Yeah, and thank you to our participants for joining uh, as well. And yeah, have a good uh, day, <laughs> evening, night and everything in between. And yeah. take care, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.